you that there is a crash as well. So if you have little uh, children, they're welcome to uh, go to crash during this time. All right, grab your Bibles with me, please, and turn to 2 Samuel chapter 7. 2 Samuel and chapter 7. Mike and Kelly have to take Mamoa back to uh, the airport today to Japan, so it's been good to, uh, to meet Mamoa, and we wish you well. Don't forget us. And uh, they have to go off to the airport right now, so uh, Lord bless her. All right, 2 Samuel chapter 7 is my text this morning. Um, really the first part of the chapter, but we'll deal with the second part a little bit as well. It seems to me oftentimes that there's this, this instinct of those who believe in God to build, to build something great for him, something long-lasting, often great buildings. Hannah and I are going to be taking our long service leave break later this year in, in July, August, September, and uh, we're going to hit a few places uh, on the way back from the States. It's been like 14 years since we've been to the States, once in 20 years. So we're going to go back there, but then on the way back, we want to hit a few cool places. So we're going to go to Istanbul and to, uh, to Lisbon, to, to Portugal. And I've been reading about both those places. I don't know much about them until recently. Uh, Lisbon has lots of cathedrals. In fact, one's called the Lisbon Cathedral, uh, built um, a long, long time ago, the 12th century. And of course, Istanbul is full of religious edifices, some built around 300 AD, um, early church type stuff, Constantinople. And uh, now it's kind of changed hands on a lot of the stuff is uh, Islamic, um, but originally it was Christian. Uh, so both those places are filled with these great edifices uh, that were dedicated to God because God's people often like to build great things for him. It might not be cement or, or wood or stone. Uh, you know, church leaders can become very preoccupied with church growth and there can become a great emphasis upon numbers. Or it might be Christian resources. You know, imagine, it's hard to imagine, but imagine if I wrote a book. I'm not like my dad. I wish I had his gift. Um, but if I wrote a book, let's say, on preaching or teaching or something, and then I thought, wow, this is really good. I want to place it in every church around Australia or put it on the web or whatever, um, because everybody ought to know this. This is a good thing that I've written, but I haven't written anything. But you can imagine that, you know, if I did that. My, my point is, though, that we have this great desire to to build, to do something great for God, something that might live on after we're gone. Um, and, and one motive, obviously, is to glorify God. Another motive might be, though, too, that sometimes we feel like the church and Christians and Christianity, it just seems so weak at times. Um, it, it just seems so unremarkable. Um, from the outside, the church can seem very, very weak. Um, maybe there's a, a church somewhere and there's very, very few believers. Um, I was reading this week that the average church attendance in Australia is about 128 per Sunday. That puts ECG right on the average. So you think, oh, we're very small, but actually we're, we're pretty average. Um, but in other places around the world, uh, church attendances can be very low. In the UK right now, it's in the 20s for your average church. Or in other places, it's even, even lower than that. Maybe it's your AFES group at university. You say, well, we only have three or four believers that, that meet together. Or like Sam's high school group that meets Christians at Woodvale High School. Um, very, very few Christians there. Maybe it's a prayer group at your workplace. And you say, well, this is a great company. It's a huge company, but there are so few Christians that meet here. The church, Christians can seem so weak, so puny. Maybe you think that, you think, well... Somebody ought to do something great for God. Wouldn't you like to build something great for him or do something long-lasting? And I think that's the thought that David had here in 2 Samuel chapter 7. Let me bring you up to speed what's going on here. Uh, ever since David was chosen by God, he's been waiting and waiting and waiting to be crowned king. Well, now it's happened. We waited all the way through 1 Samuel and into the first part of 2 Samuel, now he's been anointed king, not just over one part, not just over Judah, but over the entire Israel, and he's made Jerusalem his capital. We saw last week how he brought the uh, Ark of the Covenant, uh, the, the symbol of God's presence, 
into Jerusalem, the city of David. So things are going really well for David. But you can almost sense his restlessness at the start of chapter 7. You can, you can picture the scene here. We're told in verse 1 that the Lord had given David rest over all his enemies. So it's a quiet evening at the palace. And Nathan the prophet and David are having a cappuccino or something stronger. And they're just kind of looking over the kingdom. And, and David's restless. And as he looks around, he thinks to himself, it doesn't seem right. It doesn't seem right to me that here I am living in this big, beautiful palace, this ornate place. And the Ark of God, the Ark of the Covenant, the symbol of God's presence, is out there under canvas in a tent. The symbol of God's presence is in that place. Now, straight away, we know what David's thinking. He's thinking of a temple, a permanent home, a glorious home at that. And it seems like Nathan the prophet also is thinking, well, this might be a good thing. He has no objections. In fact, in verse 3, he says, go do all that's in your heart. The Lord's with you. Maybe Nathan is thinking, I'm the prophet. Things will improve for me if I get a temple as well. So it seems everything is, is great until Nathan goes to bed that night and God speaks to him. So let's, let's read together. This is in 2 Samuel chapter 7. Let's read the first part of the chapter. Now when the king lived in his house, his palace, and the Lord had given him rest from all his surrounding enemies, the king said to Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in the house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells in a tent. And Nathan said to the king, Go do all that's in your heart, for the Lord is with you. But that same night the word of the Lord came to Nathan, Go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, would you build me a house to dwell in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day, but I have been moving about in a tent for my dwelling. In all places where I have moved with all the people of Israel, did I speak a word with any of the judges of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now, therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, I, sorry, my David, thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, that you should be prince over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went, and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them so that they may dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more. And violent men shall afflict them no more as formerly from the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel. And I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men but my steadfast love will not depart from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. In accordance with all these words, in accordance with all this vision, Nathan spoke to David. So you can imagine Nathan and David go to bed that night, and Nathan has this vision. Everything changes in verse 4. That same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan. And what God says to Nathan, the prophet, and to, to David, completely changes David, David's plans and completely changes the history of the world forever. Now, you need to know that this is probably the most important passage in the whole of First and Second Samuel. It's one of the most significant in the Bible. And we're very privileged to look at that this morning. Let's pray for God's help. Let's pray together. 
Our Father God, we thank you that you are a speaking God. And we thank you that you have spoken your word. And we ask that you would speak to us today through your word. And I pray that you'd help me to, to teach and to concentrate, uh, to teach your word faithfully. Help us to listen to you and understand. We praise in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so David wants to build a temple. He wants to build a building. He wants to build a temple. But God says in reply, in short, God says, David, this is not about what you will do. This is not about what you will do, David. It's about what I will do. It's about what I will do. And it's not just about building a building. It's about building an eternal kingdom. So first, God says, it's not about you, it's about me, David. I'll put it this way in the notes. It's not our efforts, it's God's grace. It's not our efforts, it's God's grace. Verse 17 tells us Nathan goes back to David and he reports to David everything God had told him. Now, I don't know if Nathan woke up David in the middle of the night. Um, I guess he probably waited until morning because he didn't want to interrupt the king. But he goes down, and, and I can imagine David probably didn't sleep at all. He's thinking all these plans through in his head. He has all these great dreams going through his head. And Nathan's first words would have taken the wind right out of David's sails. So verse 5, Thus says the Lord, would you build me a house to live in? Or as another version says, are you to build a house for me to live in? In other words, are you the one, David? Is this your work, David? I've never lived in a house before since the day I brought my people out of Egypt. I've been in a tent all this time. Have I ever asked anyone to do this for me? I don't know if you've ever been given a present that you really didn't want. I'm sure you're very gracious, but sometimes that happens. It's a bit awkward. Uh, if somebody's gone through all this trouble for you, and especially if they spent a lot of money and you really don't want it or need it, it's like God is saying here to David, David, did you consult me first? D did you inquire of me first? Did I ask for this big gesture, David? Well, no. And David's missing the point. God shows him that by reminding him of Israel's history, of David's own history, who is it that's behind everything, David? It's always been me. I didn't need anything. It's always been me in charge. So verse 6, I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt. That's the Exodus, of course. The Exodus, which was a great demonstration of God's power to carry out his plans to save his people. He rescues them graciously, and then he brings them to Mount Sinai and says, this is how you should live as my people. He's rescued them out of Egypt. Verse 8, God says to David, it was I who turned you from being a humble shepherd into a king over Israel. Verse 9, God was the one who defeated all of David's enemies, right? And who brought them to this secure position. And David's sitting in this palace. He's very secure. All his enemies are, are quiet. They're gone. It's all been God's work. And then God points to David to the future. And he says, here's the future. Uh, if you notice this in verse 9, 10, 11, 12, it's all God. I will, I will, I will. Verse 9, I will make for you a great name. Verse 10, I will appoint a place for my people Israel. Verse 11, I will give you rest from your enemies. It's all God's doing. Do you see that? Uh, then it expands even more. Verse 11, here's the expansion. Moreover, I love that word, moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make for you a house. It wasn't at all what David was thinking. David was thinking, I'm going to build a house for God. God says to David, I'm going to make a house for you. Verse 12, when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body. I will establish his kingdom forever. Verse 13, I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. It's God's work throughout. There's none of this, okay, David, David, you got the crucial part. You got the important part. There's none of that. It's all of God. His plans are guaranteed by Him. Now, 
I think that's something that we all need to learn a lesson, not just for David here, but for all of us, that anything we want to do for God, anything we want to do for Him, we depend totally upon Him. It just came to mind that, that psalm, unless the Lord builds the house. You're going to labor in vain if it's not God's idea and God's doing. We depend on Him. It's His grace. That's true in the most essential sense. If we want to please, if we want to be right with God, if you're an unbeliever and you want to be made right with God, it's His work. It's His doing. This is where Christianity turns on its head all the other religions of the world, right? Um, it's the difference between do and done. I've talked about this before. I talked about this in baptism class and sharing the gospel. It's the difference between do. All the religions of the world say, do, 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 do. You must do this. If you want to please God or the gods, you have to do these things. You have to do these rituals, do these tasks. Christianity says, done. Jesus did the work for you. It's all been done. You have to trust in what he has done. Christian Christianity says, it's not about what you do, just as well, because you can never do enough, right? No, it, it, instead in his word, God says, look what I have done. Look what I've done in sending my son Jesus to die on a cross, to take the punishment for your sin so that you might be forgiven if you trust in him. Look at what I've done through my son. And, and this is good news that Christians talk about all the time. That's good news. It's not good news for me to say, you must go and do these things, and then you'll be right with God. That's not good news. That's work. Jesus has done all the work for you, right? It's a wonderful relief to discover that it's all in God's hands and not ours. And maybe that, you know, that goes through the whole Christian life, not just your salvation, but anything we want to do for God, we depend on Him, on His grace. If you're anything like me, you quickly forget that. You lose sight of that. Uh, and the Christian life becomes very discouraging and very hard because we think it all relies on us. Pastors are like this. It's his grace, it's his doing that we rely on. So whatever our projects, might be a particular battle with sin that you're having, temptation, or it might be that you're really struggling to serve others, or to love others, maybe in the church family, as the video was talking about this morning. Maybe that's hard. Or maybe you're trying to re reach particular people with the gospel. We're praying for Harry, or we're praying for people in your family, your neighbors. And that's particularly hard. You think, how can we do this? All of those things, they're all God's work. I'm not saying do nothing. I'm not saying that at all. But I'm saying it's his work that we rely upon. We trust in him. We depend on him. And so we need to listen to his word. Here's Jesus in John 15. Jesus says to his disciples, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, it is he that bears much fruit. He's the vine. We're not the vine. We're, we're the branches. Our job is to abide in him, to trust in him, to connect with him. And if we depend on him, we will bear much fruit. Then Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. Can't do anything. It's not our efforts. It's God's grace. Now, again, I'm not saying do nothing. Don't be a do-nothing church. But do it on the basis that Christ has done it all for you. That's liberating Amen? Second thing, second lesson. Not a building, David, but an eternal kingdom. An eternal kingdom. Now, I'm sure we can understand this. Maybe we can even relate to this. David has a desire to leave something permanent for God after he's died, for the ark of God to be in a permanent place, not just a tent. A tent does seem very temporary for God's ark. And so David wants to build something glorious, something that will last. And as God tells him what he will do, we discover that David's instinct throughout the future is, is sort of right, but it's just that God's plans are much, much bigger. God's plans are much bigger than what David had in mind. It's like thinking, uh, you ask your dad for a present, and you say, you know, Dad, can you give me, can, can I have a bicycle? And, and your dad says, I'll give you a 
rocket ship or, or something like that. You know, it's so much bigger than what we're imagining. David wants to build a house for God. There's, there's a play on words happening here. I want you to see this, a play on words. David wants to build a house for God. God wants to give a house to David. But when God says he will establish a house for David, he means a dynasty. You follow? That kind of a house. We're, we're going to go see that new movie, um, Dune. I hope it's good. But if you know the story, it's, it's all about different houses, different dynasties in that, in that place. So the, the, house, the house of, of Harkonnen, the house of Artrades, and, and, and things like that. The, the dynasties, the families of all these things. So that's the idea here. God says, I will raise up one of your descendants to build a house for me. He will be my son, and he will establish my kingdom forever. And when we hear God's plans laid out like that, suddenly the stone and cedar temple that David is thinking of does not seem so impressive. Here God speaks of his future, of what he's planned, and David's plans just don't seem so grand anymore. And, and we should really be blown away if we think about the scope of God's promises here. The, the, the scope is huge. It seems like every week I'm giving you a quotation from this commentary I really like by Dale, Dale Rel, Ralph Davis. Dale Ralph Davis. Let me share with you his points on this. He has three points about this great kingdom that God is establishing here. Number one, death does not annul it. Number two, sin cannot destroy it. And number three, time will not exhaust it. So first thing about God's eternal kingdom, death does not annul it. It does not bring it to nothing. No, no, death does not do that. And that's part of the significance of a, of a dynasty, right? That after one king dies, his son then follows that line through. We were watching another movie this week, and the whole movie is about, will there be a son to follow through my dynasty? And there wasn't, and it was such a big issue for Napoleon back then. Israel had great leaders in the past. They had Moses and Joshua and people like that, but they died. And then after they died, you have the judges, and you have people like Samson and Gideon and Deborah and um, Jephthah and all these people. They were pretty good leaders, but then they died, and a new one had to come and so on. They, they just didn't last forever. And that's why a king was so important to them, because with a king, you've always got someone to succeed them, and David himself would die soon, um, but that wouldn't be the end. And so here God's promising a dynasty. He will establish David's line forever. When God chose David as king, he was establishing an unbreakable line that would stretch out forever. And of course, that greatly affects the way that we read the Old Testament, because we come across language like, a king in the line of David, or a son of David, or a branch of David, or a shoot from the stump of Jesse, where Jesse was his father, and we're anticipating the next one to come. But it also affects how we read the New Testament, because we open up in Matthew chapter 1, and we read that really boring part, we think it's not so boring, it's not boring when you see it in this light. In Matthew 1, the genealogy, it's all about David's line actually goes all the way back to Abraham. So we don't dismiss that long list of names. We think, yes, this is 2 Samuel chapter 7 being fulfilled. This is God's great promise being fulfilled. And I hope that that's what you're like when you get to Matthew chapter 1 in your Bible readings. You think, wow, this is great. God is fulfilling his promises. And it helps us understand the very great anticipation that we see in the Gospels when the Messiah comes. And John the Baptist says, Behold, here he is. Behold the Lamb. He's, he's come to establish his kingdom forever. And it helps us anticipate the significance of what happened when Jesus says to the disciples, uh, KSK read this earlier, Who do you say that I am? And Peter replies in Matthew 16, You are the Christ. You are the Messiah. You are the son of the living God. And when we hear those words, we know that God is keeping his promise. The anointed one from David's line, who is also the son of God, he's come. And even though he dies, 
God's promise is not annulled. It's not canceled out. God raises him from the dead and seats him on his throne forever. So death does not annul God's promise. Second thing, sin cannot destroy it. Now, sin was a great problem with Israel. It's a great problem for us. You remember all those judges? They might have been great in various ways. Samson was a great man. But he was a failure in so many other ways. And Gideon, Gideon didn't end very well. And other judges and so on, they're famous for their flaws as well as for their great rescues. And then you, know, you think of their first king, you think of Saul, um, who wouldn't obey God. And then we come to David. So far, David seems like a pretty good guy, a, a very good king. But then we come later on to some of his great flaws at the end of his life. He remains blameless, but he's not sinless. He, we find out later he becomes an adulterer and a murderer. So that problem of sin goes on and on. Solomon, his son, you know, just like his father, Solomon starts off pretty well. He's well known for his wisdom, for his great kingdom. And then his heart is led astray, and the result is the kingdom is split in two. And then from then on, God's people are ruled by this, this association of kings who are sometimes pretty good, Josiah, and sometimes pretty awful, like Manasseh. But as verse 14 warns, they're punished for their disobedience as God's people are, are, are oppressed in various ways. Until finally, one comes from the line of David, and at his baptism, a voice comes from heaven saying, You are my beloved son. You are the son I love. With you, I am well pleased. And the son of David, who is the son of God, is not just blameless, he's sinless. And the people who lived with him for, for many years knew that. And yet, though he was sinless, he came and he died a sinner's death, taking on himself the sin of God's people. Sin could not destroy God's promise. The king comes to destroy the effects of sin. And then the third thing, time will not exhaust it. Time will not exhaust God's great promise. And how great a promise this is. So you have verse 11. This is a great verse. God says, He's the one who will build a house for David. I'm going to establish David's line, his dynasty. And God says, I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Verse 16, and your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever, 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 forever. Just really emphasizing it. And so when God chose David, he's choosing him as one who will begin this great dynasty leading to Christ. God had his eye on eternity. So when Jesus' disciples say to him, as Case Gay read earlier, you know, Peter says, you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus says in reply, you know, to those who've recognized him as king, he says, blessed are you, Simon bar Jonah, Simon son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father is in heaven, and I tell you, how's this promise? You are Peter, and on this rock of who Jesus is, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The son of David, who is the son of God, will build his church, and the gates of hell will not overcome it. So I want you to see here that God's promise then is fulfilled ultimately in his body, in the church, as Jesus builds a kingdom out of those who come to him as king and trust in him to rescue them. And that kingdom will never be destroyed because he will reign forever and ever and ever. So how do we respond to that? We ought to respond as, as David responded in the, the second half of the chapter. I'll, I'll just pick out a few things. David responds in praise. He responds in humility and in, in, in awe. It, it seems like David's plans are just forgotten. There's no talk about David's idea of building a temple. No, he's just staggered by God's grace. 2 Samuel 7, 18. Who am I, O Lord God, and what is my house that you have brought me thus far? He's overwhelmed by God himself. 
Verse 22, therefore you are great, O Lord God, O sovereign Lord. There is none like you, and there is no God besides you, according to all that we have heard with our ears. And he, he realizes this, this immense privilege of being a part of God's people. Verse 23, who is like your people, Israel, the one nation on earth whom God went to redeem to be his people, making himself a name? And it goes on, verse 24, and you establish for yourself your people, Israel, to be your people forever, and you, O oh Lord, became their God. So how should we respond to this? As believers, we ought to respond in the same way, praise and trust and awe. The hallelujah chorus ought to be ringing through our ears. And he shall reign forever and ever. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And we should also be filled with great confidence. Because although the church at times, God's people, do seem rather puny, rather weak, rather small in the world's eyes, we need to remember that this is what God's talking about here. It's something that will last forever, built on, on Jesus himself, built on the gospel. And therefore, it'll be the one thing that endures when the world comes to an end. The church will continue. So be encouraged. Be encouraged. If you feel as though the group of believers where you meet is very small at work, remember you're part of God's eternal plans. Be encouraged. And I, I guess this challenges us too as we make our big plans in our life, in our career, in the church. If you really want to be significant, if you really want to be doing something great for God, then your plans better be wrapped up with this one because he's the main event, right? One day, one day, God willing, we're hoping and praying to have a place of our own, a place where we can gather and worship together and teach and serve and so on. That's a great thing. It is a great thing if, if we don't lose sight of the main building that's already going on, the work of reaching out to people with the gospel. That's the main building work, right? That's the main kingdom. And if having a church building will help facilitate that, then that's a great thing. The main thing is that we seek to build up believers as disciples. And that's a great lesson for all of us if we want to do something great for God. God has declared what his plans are. And they're centered on his king and the people he's drawing to his king. And so we need to be committed to that. Verse 25. Look what David's response is. He says, And now, O Lord God, now, O sovereign God, confirm forever the word that you've spoken concerning your servant and concerning his house, and do as you have spoken, and your name will be magnified forever. Shouldn't we submit all of our plans, our future, our careers, our family, our church, to his plans? And shouldn't we say, Lord, keep your promise and let your kingdom come. Let's pray. How great you are, O sovereign Lord. There is none like you. There is no God but you. And our Father, we pray that we might have the same attitude as David here. We thank you for these very great and precious promises that we have here. And we thank you for how they were perfectly fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we ask that you would help us to live in, in light of your kingdom, in the light of your promises, that we will be fully devoted to your king. For we ask this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Ken Kidwell has our Lord's Supper today. Thank you. Thank you, Ken.